Um, I don't know if any of you read the blurb um, that comes around um, in relation to all the different talks that are going to be presented. Um, and I don't know if you saw, recognised um, where I had plagiarised my introduction from. Did anybody recognise this? No. No? My, my, my sort of the heading for, for the session is called Prevent an Unexpected Journey. Um, and that quote was plagiarised from The Hobbit oh. um, when Bilbo Baggins talks about this unexpected journey that he went on. Um, and in a way, um, I suppose that's how it was for me, because I ended up in Prevent, not actually ever expecting to work in Prevent. Um, but to start off, I want to tell you um, a story, a very personal story um, about something that really opened my eyes to what was happening around this agenda. Um, and it relates to an incident in May 2016, when I was con contacted late one afternoon by the local police where I was living. Um, and they asked me to come and attend a meeting in, in the headquarters that was all very cagey. And um, they said, if you come, we'll, we'll explain what it's all about. And it turned out to be one of these um, independent advisory groups that the police set up when there's some sort of a serious incident that's, that's taken place. Um, and when I got to the meeting, I discovered that four young men, four international students um, from our local university had been arrested under the Terrorism Act. And they were currently being taken to um, the local police station where they'd set up one of these um, sterile rooms in order to do all the sort of necessary bits and pieces that they do when you're arrested as a suspected terrorist. Um, and it had all related to um, a fifth man who earlier that morning had gone to see his GP. He'd been feeling very unwell. Um, he'd gone to see the GP, he'd come out of the surgery, was walking down the road um, and he'd collapsed. Passersby called an ambulance, they took him to the hospital and he went into a coma. Now, the hospital staff somehow or another managed to get access to his mobile phone and to his contact numbers, and they dialed the last number in his phone that he'd rung. And it just happened to be um, a fellow student, one of the four who'd been arrested. And the nurse explained the situation to her, told her what had happened, um, and the student said, I'm, I'm coming to the hospital. But before going to the hospital, he called his other friends to tell them what had happened. And if any of you sort of know any international students, you, you'll probably know that when they come over here, they come to the universities, they don't have any families around them, and they very quickly bond. Um, and they become a family within their own right. So these guys were sort of ringing around, telling each other what had happened to their friend, and they all said, right, we need to get to the hospital. So these four students um, turn up at the, the hospital, um, they're standing around their friend. He's actually gone into a coma. Um, the hospital staff don't know what's going on with him. They're very worried. They're, they're talking very loudly, trying to find out who they need to contact. Does anybody know some of his family who live down in London? And somewhere in all of this kerfuffle that's taking place, the nursing shift changes, um, and new staff come onto the ward. Um, one of the four friends who'd come to see this guy in the hospital had to get to London for an urgent meeting. So one of the other guys said, I'll drive you to the station and then I'm coming straight back. So two guys head off to the railway station, leaving the two others in the hospital. Um, in the meanwhile, um, a nurse who is examining the patient comes to the conclusion that some of the marks that are appearing on this guy's body um, are chemical burns. Um, she found it really suspicious that these four foreign guys were hanging around him, um, were panicking, were talking a strange language, um, and she believed she heard a ticking coming from his rucksack. So she called the police. Um, and shortly after the police made the call, armed police officers with dogs turned up at the hospital and arrested the students, two of the students anyway. But they'd been told that there were four men. So they then put armed officers at all of the entrances to the hospital, and they were questioning people as they were coming in. There was a fifth friend. I mean, it does begin to sound a bit like a carry-on movie, to be quite honest. There was a fifth friend who was working, um, who had heard about his friend. And as soon as he was able to leave work, he left work, got into the car, 
drove home to his heavily pregnant wife and says to her, um, I'll be back in an hour. I need to go check out what's happening. In the meanwhile, student number three, who'd gone to the railway station, turns up at the hospital, finds all the police there. And at the minute he gives them his name and tells them who he's coming to see, he's arrested. So they now have three guys. The fourth guy, who turns up, parks his car at the hospital, has the same thing, goes to the door, tells them who he's coming to speak to, um, and he's promptly arrested. So they have their four suspected terrorists in custody and are taking them to the local police station. What didn't help matters was the fact that um, the Queen was visiting the town on the same day, so local tensions were a little bit high as well, I must admit. Um, and to be quite fair, and, and you know, don't, can't knock the nurse in this, she was actually following the only procedures that she had. That if you hear and see anything suspicious, you need to contact the police, which is what she did. This was in 2006, when the police, the counter-terrorism police, were the only people that you could actually speak to if you were worried about something around terrorism. Bearing in mind, this was, you know, what, less than, less than a year after the 7th of July bombings as well. Now, all four of those guys were released within 48 hours um, because it was pretty evident as soon as they'd got them into the police car that, you know, a really, really big mistake had been made. What I won't forget is the look of absolute horror in their eyes when I went to collect them from the police station. Um, and myself and my family spent the next few days with these guys, basically letting them relive the experience that they had had. They never told their families what they went through because they'd come to this country quite simply for an education um, and they wanted to get back to their studies. And as one of them said, you know, my parents started saving the day that I was born so that I could get an English degree and I will not disappoint them. What happened to the student who was taken ill? Sadly, he died. The chemical burns um, were actually his body reacting to some hair regrowth treatment that he'd bought while he was in Pakistan. Um, he was due to get married. He was worried about his hair thinning out. And unfortunately, his body just completely shut down as a result of this stuff. The ticking in the box was a clock quite simply. The nurse did hear a ticking, but it was a clock. Um, and Pakistani students, Pakistanis generally, you know, when we get excited and we speak Urdu, we te do tend to start speaking quite loudly as well. So you can sort of see where this sort of, this panicky, worried thing might have come from. Um, and yes, you know, a nurse picked up the telephone and called the counter-terrorism police. There wasn't anything else that she could do. But this was 12 years ago. Um, and our approach to counter-terrorism has somewhat changed. Um, and for those of you who may be familiar with um, our counter-terrorism strategy, um, it consists of four Ps. Prepare, pursue, protect, and prevent. Prevent is very much the safeguarding strand that works by challenging ideologies, that support terrorism and extremism, by protecting vulnerable individuals, and by supporting sectors and instigation, um, institutions to mitigate the risk. Prevent is very much that strand of the counter-terrorism strategy, which is about trying to support people who might not have done anything wrong, but there is a risk that if they don't get the support at the right time, then there is a chance they may go down a completely different path. You may also be familiar with the Counterterrorism Security Act. Now, this came into effect um, in 2015, and what this did was place a duty on relevant authorities to pay due regard to the threat of terrorism. And there's, there's all sorts of conversations that are taking place um, around what due regard means and, and how do we do that. And you can see, hopefully, um, a list on there of some of the areas that you know, we actually work in to try and make sure that institutions and individuals receive the right help and the right support around this um, particular you know, agenda. Um, and sadly, you know, when we talk about threats of terrorism, it's a threat that we've seen, unfortunately, played out a bit too often. 
um, since June 2016 to the end of last year, um, we had six major terrorist atrocities. What many people don't always realise is that the, since the brutal murder of drummer Lee Rigby, 21 major incidents have been foiled in this country by our security services. Over 300,000 items of terrorist-related material have been taken down from the internet since 2010. 150 attempted journeys to Syria were stopped since 2015. And since 2012, over 1,000 people have received support through Channel. Now, if you're not familiar with Channel, um, it's an intensive one-to-one -one mentoring program that challenges violent views through deprogramming, dewiring um, an individual by presenting the other side. It's basically about them getting the help and the support they need at the right time. And yes, Channel has turned around um, many lives. We've got examples such as um, the 10-year-old lad who stood up in his class on his chair and swore allegiance to Daesh simply because he had inadvertently come across videos of beheadings on YouTube and had been listening to some of the rhetoric that they were coming out with. We have the example of a young lad called Callum who was getting enveloped into the world of far-right extremism or the two brothers who tore up um, their tickets to Syria as a result of speaking to individuals who were running um, a drug rehabilitation program. Um, and yes, there's lots and lots of controversy surrounding the prevent element of counter-terrorism strategy, you know, and a lot of it does stem from this historic belief that prevent is all about Muslims, and it's about spying on Muslims, particularly when we talk about university settings. I mean, how many of you remember headlines like this? Yeah? And whilst the prevent strategy may have been targeting Muslims in the beginning, yeah, the coalition government in 2011 and the subsequent conservative government made it explicitly clear that prevent is about all forms of terrorism, whether that's Islamist, whether that's far right, whether it's animal rights. I don't know if any of you have seen in recent weeks some of the stuff that has been out there. And I visit institutions where the biggest issues they're having are around far right activists. In December 2016, the Home Secretary took a very bold step. And for the first time, in this country, she banned a far-right organisation by the name of National Action. A far-right neo-Nazi organisation she described as a vile, racist, homophobic and anti-Semitic group which glorifies violence and stirs up hatred while promoting their poisonous ideology. And I will not allow them to masquerade under different names. She also banned two other groups about six months later, a group called NS121 and Scottish, jo Scottish Dawn. Um, and actually this week you may have heard that there were a number of arrests that were made of individuals who were part of National Action as well. It's not, this isn't just rhetoric. This, this, is actually, this is action that is being taken. This is action against all forms of hatred and bigotry that's actually used to divide the society that we're living in. The second story that I want to tell you about relates to an event that I attended just over a year ago where a lady by the name of Nicola Ben Yahya was speaking. Now Nicola's son Rashid ran away from home and went to join Daesh in 2015 and I met her at an event where she spoke about her personal journey coming to terms with what her son had done. Rashid was killed fighting for Daesh. And what she said was, I don't even know where my son is buried. I can't go and pray at his graveside. And I wish to God somebody, something like Prevent, had picked him up and stopped him from going to Syria. You can read about Nicola and her son Rashid. There is a, there is a whole um, program on, on the internet that you can access, My Son the Extremist, um, which tells you what went on. Um, and, and how you know, Nicola and her family are having to live with those consequences. 
as the chair said at the beginning, I've worked in Prevent for five years. And you do sometimes start to question your own sanity, hearing and seeing some of the things that you do, especially when the abuse starts. Since my early 20s, I've worked in all sorts of grassroots community initiatives. I've worked with homeless shelters. I've worked with prisons, hate crime organizations, you know, across the board. Um, but it tends to be around um, working with a whole range of causes that affect the quality of life of groups and individuals, vulnerable individuals, and attempting to build bridges between communities. And actually tackling radicalization isn't just the role of people in our schools and in our colleges and in our universities. If we really, really do want to tackle the issues that are causing our vulnerable individuals to be radicalized, we have to have everybody on board. We have to have parents, communities, faith groups, you know, nurses, doctors, everybody needs to be part of what is a societal problem and it needs a societal response. We can't achieve you know, the types of stuff that we talk about. I'm sure we'll be hearing all sorts of different events and, and group sessions today around community integration, community cohesion. And actually, we can't do any of that unless everybody is fully on board with this agenda. And ultimately, ultimately, what we're talking about is safeguarding. Safeguarding our young people, safeguarding our societies, safeguarding our communities. Um, and that's a role, actually, that I think we've all got got a role in.